is tripping out by who is here. Um, I have, uh, there's, there's uh, folks from Detroit, there's folks from Kundalini Yoga, there's folks from the Women's Building, from my water aerobics class. It's just um, so beautiful to see each and every one of you. So thank you so much for uh, making the effort to spend this time with me. Um, I'm very excited to launch this book into the world. We're going to have um, readings of three excerpts and um, okay, sorry. Um, we're gonna have readings of three excerpts, two of them by professional actors. I'm very excited to hear the work in their voice. Um, then we're going to have a little bit of audience participation, nothing scary, uh, nothing forced, but, um, you know, most of you know me, so you know that I like that. And uh, then there'll be a Q&A, which is also audience participation. Um, and I think that's uh, what I know. Um, and... It's my great pleasure to introduce our first reader, who is uh, a voice actor. Uh, I always say he could read the phone book to me and it would sound brilliant. Um, a storyteller, and perhaps most importantly for me, a writer of poetry and creative nonfiction. So please give a warm welcome to Bill Ratner. Thanks, Terry. Chapter one. The security line in the American Airlines terminal at JFK snaked around several times. The airport was crowded with people taking advantage of the three-day weekend, President's Day, whatever that meant. Most people could no longer tell you which presidents the day was intended to honor. Marielle had gotten to the airport in plenty of time. But she hated waiting in any circumstance, and it was making her cranky. But everything was irritating her today. In the cab on her way to the airport, she'd taken a call from her attorney Reza. The option on her last novel, The Time Before the Last Time, had lapsed, and the film company was not going to renew. The Pan America event that had brought her from temperate Los Angeles to New York in the dead of winter had been a listless affair, even though she'd been the keynote speaker. All anyone in her industry could talk about was the death of publishing. Even as she'd gamely delivered her prepared address about the freedom of speech, she couldn't help but wonder, what good was speech if no one was listening anymore? Then, at dinner, she'd been stuck sitting next to the man who won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction last year. Her Pulitzer, the first time she'd been nominated and she deserved to win. But she hadn't won, and the dance of appearing to be gracious while the winner appeared to be humble had sparked her umbrage anew. New York in February had never been her idea of a good time, and she was fuming about the frigid, slippery streets and the overheated rooms and the bristly competitiveness that charged the atmosphere whenever writers gathered. Her temples pounded with a hangover from the previous night, the other thing guaranteed when writers convene was that there would be a lot of drinking. And she was grumpy, too, about having succumbed to the charms of a young journalist she'd met in the elevator of her hotel. Araceli? She thought that was it. She'd been flattered to receive the intention of a woman who decades, was decades younger than she was. Several mojitos at the reception following her speech had helped convince her that the young woman's declaration that Mario was her role model was not a red flag. Or maybe she had known, but didn't care. She'd been lonely for a long time. She'd been too intoxicated to remember much about the sex itself. And afterward, all the young woman really seemed to want from her was to agree to blurb her first novel, coming out next spring. But worse than all these things, Mariel was currently stuck on Chapter 7 of the first draft of a new novel. For Mariel Wing, the blank page was her enemy. 
its slick white face always taunting her to prove herself anew, a void sneering that no words would come ever, that her true nature was emptiness. Despite nine published novels, each garnering praise or prizes or both, Mario still found it punishing to eke out a first draft. She hated the not knowing, the clumsy stage of having to wander and flail, the struggle to bring a world into being. She'd never had children. Though many lesbians did, she'd never wanted to. This barrenness she embraced, but she'd frequently likened the first draft process to labor, excruciating, protracted, and bloody. It was in subsequent drafts that she became a sculptor of the language and ideas, an architect of plot, a weaver of character and theme. She was trying to pinpoint the real problem of Chapter 7, at the same time as she was checking messages on her iPhone. The security line seemed not to have moved the entire time she'd been standing there. She was only half paying attention, when suddenly her body was shoved hard and propelled forward. There was a sound so loud she felt it on her skin, repeating again, again, again. The word bomb slowly crawled into her consciousness. Then fire and smoke and screaming. Some people dropped to the ground. Others scrambled. Once she had a word for it, Marielle grew calm. She had always been someone who became unnaturally composed in a crisis. During the Northridge earthquake in 94, her then-partner Liana had become unhinged as the pitching of the house had jolted them awake at 4.17 a.m. Marielle had wrapped her body around Liana's wiry frame, rolled them off the bed and onto the floor, whispering, it's okay, it's okay, until the shaking stopped. Now, even with her ears ringing from the blasts, even as chaos surrounded her, her senses were heightened, not dulled. She dropped into a crouch and began to scan the scene. Her writer's instinct took over. That was how she happened to notice the two men who came running in her direction. Despite the pandemonium, the two ran in the opposite direction of the panicked scrimmage to exit the terminal. They ran right past her, and she observed details, the orange sweatshirt and gray athletic pants worn by one, the gold cross that flapped against his chest as he sprinted, the scar that had taken part of the other man's eyebrow, and the words he yelled at his companion, Go to Magda, it sounded like his accented voice cutting through the roar of sound that filled the terminal. Marielle, without planning it, without even fully realizing what she was doing, lifted the iPhone, still clutched in her hand, and snapped a photo. It was reflexive, a habit. The phone was set on camera because she often took a picture when she saw something she might want to describe later in a piece of writing. The taller of the two men, the one in orange, saw her do it. For a second, their eyes locked as he passed her. Then they were gone. There was something else, too. A white man with a short-cropped gray head and hair and an impressive case of rosacea. Where had he come from? He wasn't freaking out like everyone else, but surveying the terminal, scanning in all directions. He wore a uniform. NYPD, she supposed, but maybe TSA but wasn't running or yelling or giving directions. He was watching the scene. He was watching her watch him. Without thinking any further about it, she snapped a photo of him, too. He sprinted over to her, wrested the phone out of her hand. That's mine, she protested, as she snatched at empty air. It's evidence now, she thought she heard him say. Her ears were ringing, and the air was filled with shouts and crying. Yet she heard his words. The glare of his blue eyes pierced her. Even his tone seemed to slice through her, so cold and sharp. Maybe a hint of an accent. German? Russian? He was already moving away. But how will I get it back? She called after him. We'll find you, the man called over his shoulder as he disappeared into the crowd. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. So um, she's at uh, 
JFK Airport in New York, but she lives in Los Angeles. She gets home. She, uh, finally, she is relieved to be home. She's relieved to be back in her life and her house. And she's trying to block out the trauma that she's just experienced. And um, Angela Bullock is going to pick up from here. Angela is an actress, and you may have seen her on television and in films. Uh, and and again, more importantly to me, she is a writer and is just putting the finishing touches on a gorgeous, gorgeous memoir. So please help me welcome Angela Bullock. Thank you, Terry. Late morning the next day, her doorbell rang. She took the long way through the house, through the study, the dining room, then the living room. By the time she opened the front door, no one was there. Except for a gardening crew a few houses down, there was no one to be seen up and down the street. She couldn't recall hearing a car, but her home's thick stucco walls did filter out a lot of noise, one of the many things she loved about the house. Still, it seemed strange to find no sign of whoever had rung the bell. This was scarcely the kind of neighborhood where kids would play a prank like that. But she was also relieved not to have to interact with anyone. Might she have just imagined she heard the bell? Marielle shrugged, prepared to return to her reverie in the garden. It was by happenstance that she looked down and was startled to see her iPhone lying face down on the welcome mat. For a moment, she felt disoriented. Had it dropped from her purse when she'd come in last night? Of course it hadn't. It had been confiscated by an officer after a terrorist bombing in Terminal 8. We'll find you she remembered him saying, and she guessed it was possible with technology these days, though she hadn't expected it to happen so quickly. New York was three hours ahead, but someone must have gotten on a pretty early flight to have it on her doorstep by noon. Why would they go to the trouble? She was about to turn it on when a black sedan sped up the narrow street and careened into her driveway. A slender African-American man in a charcoal suit dashed from the passenger door and yelled, Marielle Wing, don't touch that. She ignored him. Since adolescence, she would bristled at any direction given to her by a man and often acted contrarily just for spite. This tendency had been nearly disastrous with traffic cops and was one reason she always worked with women editors and chose relationships with women. Her finger hovered above the sleep wake button, ready to do just what she'd been ordered not to do. That was the moment he tackled her, pushing her body into the hedge and throwing the iPhone with as much force as he could. It exploded in the middle of the street with an astonishing burst of flame and a powerful boom that set off a chorus of car alarms. The gardeners up the street dove for cover. The man leapt to his feet as soon as the explosion stopped. He quickly dialed a number into his phone and repeated her address. She slid from the hedge down onto the flagstone and remained slumped there, ears ringing, and limbs shaking. The cacophony of car alarms seared every nerve. She had experienced her second bombing in less than 24 hours, and even though she'd been unharmed in both, her skin felt brittle and porous, useless to protect her now. The man with the yellow tie was, stay was saying something to her, but she couldn't hear. She stared intently at his lips and eventually understood that he was introducing himself as Donald Watkins' Homeland Security. She gestured wildly with her fingertips to her ears. He nodded and moved so close that she could feel his breath in her ear. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to come with me. Just then, the bomb squad van arrived, 
siren wailing and further abrading her nervous system. Two squad cars raced up and, and parked at either end of her street, closing it off while a truck sped toward the middle of the block, stopping directly in front of the smoking char that had been her iPhone. One team turned its attention to examining the remains of the detonation, no doubt to gather clues about the method of bomb making and perhaps by extension, the bomber. Another team pushed past her and entered the front door. What are they doing? She yelled. They have to search the premises, he responded. They can't, she protested. Do you have a warrant? Don't need one. It's a matter of national security. Despite the sound that still shattered her ability to think, she insisted on verifying his credentials more to assert her right to do so than because she disbelieved him. He patiently produced government identification. I need my purse and my shoes. She did need these things, but also she was stalling. She didn't want to leave her house unguarded against these officers. She didn't want to leave dude. Her orange tomcat. Uninvited, Donald Watkins followed her inside the house while the police were ransacking like a marauding army. Then she understood she did have to leave. If she stayed and watched, she'd be unable to keep from getting in one of these guys' faces and would probably end up in handcuffs or worse. Returning to the living room where Donald Watkins was pacing, she announced with far more composure, composure than she actually felt. I want my attorney to be with me during the interview. One might not suppose that a lawyer specializing in intellectual property would be of much help in such a circumstance. But Reza Caldecott was not only a negotiator of contracts and deals, she was also an expert on the First Amendment and served on the board of the ACLU. From the moment she arrived, Reza was like a bulldog with Donald Watkins. Are you charging my client with something? If you're not charging her, you can't hold her. I insist on time alone to confer with my client. What Reza lacked in height barely five feet in heels, she made more up, she, she more than made up for in belligerence. It was part of the image she carefully cultivated that she always dressed in a tailored suit of bright confrontational red. Donald Watkins coolly informed her that her client was not a suspect, but a witness in a terrorism case and under New laws enacted since 9-11, she was not even entitled to counsel, but he was allowing Reza to sit in on the proceedings as a courtesy, one, he added, that could be revoked at any time. Reza was unfazed. Courtesy my ass, she bellowed. You know that Ms. Wing has a public profile. You're just holding, you're just hoping to avoid a stink in the press. Donald Watkins made no effort to rebut Razor's protest, but went right to his point. Yesterday afternoon, there was a bombing at American Airlines ticket counter at Kennedy Airport. Four people were killed. Several other passengers were injured, including some children. We have reason to suspect that this is the work of a terrorist sleeper cell based in Hoboken. He continued, we have surveillance video that shows two suspects fleeing the scene. The same video shows Ms. Wing positioned directly in the path of their escape with a clear, direct view of their faces. We need to take your statement, Ms. Wing, work with our specialists on facial recognition, and it is likely we will need you to testify against them once these suspects are apprehended. She couldn't have seen anything, Razor broke in. The noise, the smoke, the confusion. She was on her belly trying to protect herself. Clearly, the attorney was ad-libbing. Watkins continued. When we saw on the security tape that an unidentified suspect had confiscated the cell phone of a witness had come into direct contact with her, we put considerable effort into finding her before they did. 
His look appraised Mariel. Your public profile did help us to identify you. What do you mean? An unidentified suspect? Marielle was trying to follow the conversation, but it wasn't making any sense. He was dressed in a uniform. He said it was evidence. He said, we'll find you, she did not add. We've been going over the video from the scene since it happened. The man we saw take your phone could not be identified as any of the officers on scene. We have to conclude that he had a role in the incident. Nausea swept through Marielle. It took her all her will to keep the bile from spewing onto the tidy wooden desk before her. You were almost too late, Reza argued. They had the phone. They knew who and where Marielle was a whole lot sooner than we did. Donald's tone was not apologetic. I will say that on this video, Ms. Wing demonstrates a remarkable presence of mind and a singular focus. We believe she has critical details to offer us and that she will make a convincing witness at trial. At trial, the color in Ray's cheeks flared to match her scarlet suit. My client is certainly not going to testify at trial. These people have already tried to blow her up this morning. You can't put her in that kind of danger. Donna Watkins didn't miss a beat. That's why we're prepared to enter your client into the witness security program this afternoon. That's outrageous, Razor protested. Mariel Wing is a much honored author with a public career. She can't just change her identity and go into hiding. She doesn't have a choice, Donna Watkins said curtly, cutting to the chase. This is a terrorist investigation. We're going to find and convict the perpetrators. The government can and will compel her testimony. If she refuses to cooperate, she will be sent to prison. He paused before adding, we can't guarantee her safety there. Angela, thank you so much. You're <clears throat> Later in the afternoon, after being asked the same questions in a dozen different ways by Donald Watkins and two other men with the same gray aura, just as Marielle had been loaded into the back seat of a car with tinted windows and bulletproof sides, a small man in a tan suit thrust into her hands a cat carrying case and a large tote bag. Dude greeted her with a yowling complaint. He'd never liked being in a car. In addition to hardbound copies of all nine of her published novels, Reza had packed the bag with a few foil pouches of cat food, some water, and a small dish, and a bottle of cat tranquilizers. Marielle was briefly tempted to swallow these herself. It was only later that she would find, folded up inside the pill bottle, Reza's card with a scrawled message. This is a secure phone. Call me at this number when you are alone. Reading this, Marielle felt relief wash over the numbness into which she'd lapsed. Late that night, Marielle's private plane landed at a small military airport in what she would later learn was southeastern Michigan. She knew she was no longer in California as she gazed across the, the gray tarmac, a landscape made almost lunar by the cold gleam of halogen lights, rimmed by clumps of frozen snow, dirty with smog and car exhaust. The temperature was south of freezing. It seemed she had been cold for as long as she could remember. One of the men in charge of guarding her handed her his overcoat. The car drove her to a rundown Sheraton where she and Dude were installed in a charmless room at the end of the hall on the fourth floor. 
She was introduced to Deputy Eric Oriano, a burly Latino who was staying in the room next door. This was ostensibly for her protection, but also she knew to keep an eye on her. That first day, there was no need. She ordered a bottle of white rum from room service, slept most of the day, and spent the rest of it in a kind of stupor. Dude, coming off the tranquilizers, was equally subdued. When the deputy knocked to ask if he could bring her any food from the coffee shop downstairs, she'd waved him away. The second day she awakened early and famished. She called room service for a big breakfast and called the front desk for the New York Times. They claimed not to have it, but she told them there'd be a big tip if they produced it within the hour. It showed up at the same time as her coffee and eggs, and she proffered a $20 bill, as promised. Without bothering to look at the front page, she turned directly to the arts and leisure section and could not believe her eyes. Books. Maria Wing, 51, National Book Award winner and celebrated novelist, found dead. She leaped from her seat, burst into the hallway, and started pounding her fist against the deputy's door. He looked disheveled when he opened it. Clearly, she'd woken him up. What have you done? She shoved the headline in his face. Calm down, ma'am. Deputy Oriano clearly had no idea what she was talking about. Let me talk to Donald Watkins. Who? Don't pull this shit with me. I am not in the mood, she bellowed, so angry her vision was red. Watkins, the Homeland Security agent who's responsible for me being here. Ma'am, please keep your voice down. If you don't get Watkins on the phone to me right now, I'll wake this whole goddamn building. Go back to your room, ma'am. I'll have someone call you as soon as I can. Don't fucking call me, ma'am, she raged and slammed the door to her room behind her. A few minutes later, the phone rang. Without waiting for the caller to identify himself, she answered, when were you going to tell me, you bastard? I didn't know you were such an early riser. I was planning to talk to you this morning. She was staring out the window at a bleak suburban landscape. Snow flurries had been falling since she'd awakened, but seemed to melt on the gray cement below. You have no right to kill me. I've been cooperative. I haven't done anything wrong. You can't just decide I'm dead and notify me later. It's for your protection, he insisted. I don't want them looking for you. If I'd known this was what you had in mind, I would have taken my chances on jail. Then she hung up. She went back to bed that day, even though dude paced the room howling. She wasn't asleep and she wasn't awake. She was dead. When Deputy Oriano knocked in the late afternoon and said he had her paperwork, she told him to just slip it under the door. In a manila envelope was a birth certificate. Lorraine Kaminsky, born May 1st, the same year as Marielle. They could have shaved off a few years, she thought. And did they have to make her a Taurus? Lorraine had been born to Herbert and Loretta Kaminsky in Highland Park, Michigan. She took the paper in her hands and held it up to the light. It looked just like the real thing, just a sheet of parchment. She could rip it in half, yet it had the power to take away everything she'd ever been and done. Thank you. And just um, let's take a moment to thank again, uh, Bill and Angela for their gorgeous renditions of this work. Um, and 
now I would like to just ask you to take a moment. You can uh, either write or just think, but I want you to think about a time in your own life when you gave up or lost an aspect of your identity. It might be changing a job. It might be losing or ending a relationship. It might be, you know, that time that you thought, okay, I'm going to be sober. It might be um, moving, you know, moving across the country. But just let yourself think for, we'll, we'll just take a couple minutes for you to think about that experience and how how it landed with you to do that. Oh, we need Jeopardy music. So you can um, either post your thoughts in the chat um, or if you'd like to share with the group, you can raise your virtual hand. You do that by going into reactions at the bottom of your screen and um, you'll see the thing that says raise hand. Okay, Anne, unmute yourself and tell us what you've got. I think about the time when my wife died and suddenly I was no longer part of the perfect couple. Yeah, that recreation of one's identity after a significant loss like that is, is huge. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else want to share? Eric, do we have some things in the chat? Yes, from Kimberly Esslinger. Um, coming out of a relationship getting sober and moving away all at once. I had to relearn who I was or what I wanted to be, even what mustard. <laughs> uh, what I liked, thank you, Kimberly. Sorry about that. <laughs> Anybody else? Pablo. I felt that um, I'm, I'm recalling the moment I gave up my identity as a graduate student. And it didn't happen once I defended my dissertation. It didn't happen during commencement. It actually happened at during my first faculty meeting as an assistant professor is when I felt like I lost that identity as a graduate student. And I recall it being very frightening, very scary to me. Thank you. Uh, Kara Chow posted in the chat, when I had my son, after that, my whole existence was about being Ken's mom. Okay, I'll do my best to read all of them. Um, also, Gail Conrad has her hand up. 
Oh, great, Gail. Let's see. Oh, wait. Let me put my hand down. I don't want to. Okay, lower hand. Um, two things. One, when I was about twelve, and my mother was getting not a divorce but an annulment. And we had to live in Reno, Nevada for six weeks because that's what you had to do then to get a divorce or annulment. Um, and we stayed at this really weird little motel because my mother never thought this her husband that she wanted a divorce would find us. And uh, well, he did. But um, I remember going to this school there and it was just so weird because it was like two years behind and after a while, I just stopped paying attention. I just sort of zoned out. Um, I really lost my identity there. Uh, but the other time is when I moved from New York to LA. And in this case, I sort of did it deliberately. Um, I didn't want to be known for anything I was doing in New York. I really wanted to just change everything. And then, of course, the irony is, is that little by little, I started bringing back some of those things, but on my terms. So two very different memories. Thank you, Gail. Um, I'm going to read a couple things from the chat. Uh, Mariah says, catastrophic illness emptied my life of everything but me and my cat. Career gone, hobbies gone, friends and family gone. And my heart goes out to you. I know a little bit about your particular um, struggles. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and Eric. Myself, okay. Hi, um, I was just inspired by what Gail just said to change what I wrote on the lot because there were two times in my life that that took place. Um, most recent, and, and they had two different effects. Most recently, it was um, within a very short amount of time, losing all the members of my nuclear family and feeling um, uh, as if there were questions as to who I was going to be next in this world. And then there was the, actually the one that, similar to, to Gail, was, was liberating um, I grew up in an immigrant family with very low expectations, great deal of scarcity mentality, a great deal of um, when is the other shoe going to drop sort of thinking. And um, I don't know how I managed to do it, but I got myself into school in France and I... Um, was able to reinvent. I was able to be who I wanted to be. It wasn't so much a reinvention as it was making decisions on my own that I wasn't going to end up as the night manager at Del Taco, that I could actually live in a bigger world. And and so, so one was about what I could gain, you know, as in terms of a, a larger life. Um, and the other was about um, the having to let go of the life you know, I thought I would have with the people who knew me best. Yeah. I know I spent a long time after my mom died, just like having no idea who I am, who I was. Just, yeah, thank you so much. Um, Isabella Rose says, when I studied abroad without my, my twin sister and had to find out who I was as an individual and not as a unit. Oh, what a great story not easy i think and peggy who i know from detroit hey peggy um actually i never thought about losing an identity but embodying new identities and or shaping an identity when i went to brazil for the first time i felt like i had come home and it was strange because i thought my home was in arizona but now i was also home oh i love that story thank you and uh, David Groff says, when I got fired from my job as a book editor at a corporate publisher, who was I without the identity and presence of that job? I wasn't part of a corporate family. 
ick, and I had to be my own person. It was the worst and best job thing that ever happened to me. Um, and we're lucky, David, because you've gone on to, I mean, you were doing amazing work there, but you've gone on to do really important work. And I thank you for your support of this book as well. Well, Terry, thanks so much. And I'm so glad that your novel is out in the world. And I'm hoping everyone will read it because I have, and it's really fine and funny and suspenseful. Oh, bless you. Thank you so much. Um, and Yvonne, my love, um, says, becoming an EMT, I wore a uniform and was a saver of lives. People used to thank me for my service when I wore that uniform. And she's still saving lives, even out of that uniform. Uh, Donna, Donna Curley, finishing grad school, getting sober and jumping into a relationship I probably wasn't ready to have. I was raging inwardly the entire time because I could feel it happening slowly and incrementally, and it was terrifying. And these kind of changes really are terrifying. They can be. Even when we choose them, they can be terrifying. Um, and when we don't choose them, it's just like, whoa, what hit me? Um, Marie says, hmm, so many times, but what comes to mind is after 20 plus years moving, so I was no longer in walking distance of the beach. Until I moved, I actually didn't realize how much living as a beach bum is part of who I am. So it's, you know, we construct our identities out of these details about us, out of these things we do, these things we like, these things that we're associated with. And um, we don't, we may not realize until they go away how that's how we come to know ourselves is, is through those things. Um, and then when they do go away, it's like, who, who am I going to be now? What am I going to do now? And uh, this is the condition that Mario Wing finds herself in um, because everything that she's relied on, I mean, she's just started to lose things in this first chapter. But as you read on, she loses a whole bunch more things. And, uh, you know, she has to go on that journey of how she's going to tolerate that life, how she's going to make something meaningful for herself, because she's unprepared. She doesn't, she's made the meaning that she thought. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you who contributed to this conversation. I'm very grateful. And now I would just like to uh, see if there are any questions that any of you have. Um, and they can be I, again, you can put them in the chat or you can uh, raise your virtual hand. Jennifer A says, how long did you work on this manuscript? Um, thanks, Jennifer. I, um, I probably worked on the manuscript for about seven years, but I was working on another manuscript at the same time, another project at the same time. So I had sort of a split focus, but I would uh, kind of hit a roadblock with one and then I had another one to jump over to. Um, but then the publication process was what took really, really, really a long time. So um, I started writing the book in 2006 and I probably had a mostly a draft that I was happy with in 2013. That's when I started to shop it. And uh, 10 or so years later, yeah, Kara says, I remember reading chapters. Um, so that, that was really the, the hardest part of it, not to say that writing it was easy. Uh, Sherry wrote, what was the initial spark of an idea or inspiration to write this story? Um, 
I actually went to a pen event when there was a separate West Coast pen, um, Pen USA, it was called, and it was their awards dinner. And I was uh, looking at all the writers and looking at the people who are being honored. And I felt like I wanted to write something that was more in the world. A lot of my previous novels had been kind of psychological, kind of interior. And I just thought I want to go out there and, and engage the world in a bigger way. And um, Mar Marielle appeared to me and started to tell me her story. I very much believe, um, sorry, this is woo-woo for those of you who don't like that, but I very much believe that characters exist already and they'll come and tell me what they want me to know about their stories. So um, that's how it began. Thanks for asking. Kimberly, uh, uh, oh, sorry. No, please go ahead. Kimberly asks, uh, is this or will this be a part of a, of a series? Um, I haven't been a writer of series, although sometimes I think it would be good. Um, Marielle has a best friend in this story. We, we didn't meet her in chapter one, but um, just the other day I started thinking about, well, what's her story? So maybe that's series-esque. Um, I have, let's see. Donna, what part of the process do you enjoy most? Um, definitely revision is my favorite. The first draft, I gave this quality, or Mar I share this quality with Marielle. I don't love the first draft. Uh, you know, you have to have one before you can have subsequent drafts. So, of course, I do it. But I really love to get in there once I know what the story really is about and shape it and craft it and language it. And that's um, very exciting to me. Marie asked, uh, well, she said, congratulations. Did you already have a relationship with Bella Books or did you pitch them, pitch a synopsis to them? Um, I have a relationship with Catherine V. Forrest and she was, uh, oh, back in the late aughts, um, uh, an acquisitions editor for Bella and also Spinsters. And she acquired two of my novels, Labrys Reunion and Stealing Angel for Spinsters. And then when this book was ready to go, I went to her and she, went to Bella and said, you know, let's do this. So I, I was very lucky in that regard. And she's been a wonderful champion of the book. Awesome. Um, Susan Silton says, honey, what was the process, process like researching the Witness Protection Program? Um, you know, you can't find out that much of it. <laughs> It's a little frustrating. You can find out kind of general outlines about it. Um, it was, um, but, you know, they're not going to tell you everything. So I just tried to stick to the details that I was sure about. There are some stories from people who've been in witness protection and stories about witness protection. And um, I, I obviously couldn't go undercover and research that directly. But uh, I could read about it. Angela asked, um, did you revise based on feedback received during the publishing process? Um, I didn't get, I mean, I did revise based on feedback, but the feedback was pretty minor, uh, how can I say this? It wasn't substantive. It wasn't like change this character or get rid of this subplot or anything like that. By the time I got to the publishing process, I always rely on a lot of feedback. And some of you 
have been in workshops where I brought uh, work of mine and and even this book uh, and and have given me feedback about it. So I um, rely on that outside eye and ear uh, very strongly. But um, by the time we got to the publishing process, um, the editorial feedback was not, you know, wasn't major. And one of the last questions, uh, Eric Gutierrez, I hate revision. What do you know about that process that makes it bearable, nay, enjoyable to you? <laughs> well, I take it as the opportunity to discover things I didn't know before. You know, I really take the word revision seriously. It's not editing. It's not that I've done anything wrong. It's not that anything needs to be fixed. It's an opportunity to see again and learn more. And I, I often will associate it with an archaeological process. So, you know, if you're if you're digging up a site, you don't go in with your big plow and plunge in as deeply as you can. So you're going to damage something. So you just take a little layer and then, oh, look what's under there. Okay, then I can go in with the spoon and dig a little more and dig around it. And that allows the treasures to come up. So I always try to learn something more in the revision process. Um, and sometimes people will ask me about uh, how do I know if something's done? And I'll say when, when I don't have anything more to learn from it, then I can stop revising. Okay, and I guess last question, uh, Marietta asked, in what order did you create the story, plot first or characters? Um, Mario was there from the beginning and uh, her story led me to the plot. And one of the things I was trying to do, I had read, so this is a long time ago now, but I had read uh, uh, Murakami's Kafka on the Shore, uh, which is a novel and it's a, it's a, what that novel taught me is that he's constantly introducing new elements. You never can see where the story is going. You never, you know, there's always a turn or a twist that you wouldn't have anticipated. And I thought, how can I want to do that? How can I do that? And so the, the other characters were kind of a one way for me to do that. And people came into the book that I never would have imagined when I started it out. I did not know all these folks were gonna be part of her world um, when I began, but they would introduce themselves to me and I would think, oh, okay, um, Buddhist monks, okay, Vietnam veteran, I mean, um, Iran Iraq war veteran. Um, so people showed up in surprising ways. Uh, all right, thank you. You you did so great with your audience with this audience participation, <laughs> and I'm so grateful because otherwise I'd just be like sitting here, um, and uh, you helped me out. So, um, Eric, is, oh Eric, you have a question. Yeah, I, I was wondering if you can uh, talk about a little bit of the the Curve Community and Cheris event. Oh. <laughs> You'll make my publicist so happy. So um, next Saturday, also at 4 p.m., also on Zoom uh, or online anyway, I'm going to be part of a conversation about um, mysteries and thrillers with female protagonists. And I'll be speaking with um, Barbara Wilson and Jean Redman about this topic and uh, They've been at uh, this genre a lot longer than I have been, but um, I'm looking forward to being able to talk about those issues with them. And, and Michelle is in the chat, is posting uh, the link to that. So you can, if you haven't had enough, or if you want something different, 
um, then please come see me next Saturday. Um, all right, Eric is posting links if you haven't ordered the book yet, links to do that. There's no bad way to order the book. Some people say, what's the best way? There's no bad way to order it. Not ordering it is, is the worst way. Um, and uh, Eric is also going to screen share this document. Uh, if you are so moved, there are things that you can do to support this book. Um, this is a small press, uh, Bella Books. I mean, they're mighty. They've been uh, existing for a long time, but um, you know they don't have the budget of a. Who are those big four now? I can't even name them anymore. But uh, so buying it and reading it, obviously. And I would love if you would email your thoughts and questions about it. And here's an email where you can do that. Ask your local bookstore or library to order it. Uh, if you like it, tell your friends, um, especially tell your friends who live outside of Los Angeles, because uh, it's harder for me to have uh, impact there. Uh, if you like it, you could pen a brief review on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. They really do make a difference. Um, you can take a selfie with the book cover. Some of you have done that already, and it's. I'm just so happy to see you and, and the book, and you can post it on social media. You can, of course, write a more extensive review, and if you do that, um, we'll, we'll get it to a list of places that uh, are likely to publish it. Uh, if you can afford it, buy copies and give them to people. If you know a woman's studies or LGBT studies professor, Q studies professor, recommend the book to them or give them a copy. If you are a women's studies or LGBTQ studies professor, consider assigning the book to students or invite me to come speak to the class. If you're in a book group, by all means, invite me. I'll be happy to come virtually or in person to talk about the book or have a little salon with your friends in an afternoon and um, invite me. And uh, just, you know, you're, um, it takes a village, it really does. And you're all part of my village. And I am so, so grateful for your presence, your participation and your friendship. So thank you. Thank you, Terry. Links in the chat, everybody. If you want to purchase the book, please do. It's a great thing to have. And um, thank you for coming. And Eric, uh, don't forget to copy the chat to save the chat for me. I will. Maybe. Okay, thank you. Oh, thanks to Eric. He's been my anchor. Oh, God, I just want to hang out with all of you. <laughs> all right. Bye, everybody. Have a great rest of your Saturday. Bye, Terry. Bye, everyone. Thanks.